This is the Herbalist Without Borders Herbal Action Podcast, connecting you to our community herbalists and health justice activists. HWB is a nonprofit devoted to providing compassionate, holistic care to communities in need. We believe that health care is a right, not a privilege. I'm Denise Cusack, Executive Director of Herbalist Without Borders. Leslie Alexander is a professional herbalist and owner of Restoration Herbs in Erie, Pennsylvania. Leslie is a registered herbalist with the American Herbalist Guild and is serving her third term on the AHG Council. Leslie is author of the book, Dental Herbalism, Natural Therapies for the Mouth, and teaches on this topic throughout the US. She also works with individuals one-on-one and teaches on any number of of topics, including clinical skill development and medicine making. Welcome, Leslie, and thanks for spending time to talk with me today. Uh, Denise, thanks for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to sit and chat with you. I agree. (laughs) So many herbalists may not think of oral health when working with clients. Can you tell us how oral health can impact overall wellness? Great question, and I would be delighted to start here. So we tend to think of oral health, some of us at least, as separate from the health of our bodies. And I certainly grew up in an era where the reason we cared for our mouth was solely to have a pleasant aroma. Uh, And I didn't understand as a child or indeed as a young adult that not only is the mouth the place where digestion begins, but also the mouth is intimately related to the health of the body. And one way to think about that for me is I think, Um, when we think about having an accident or an injury outside, say we're walking along and I trip and I scuff my knee and there's a bit of dirt from the curb and a bit of blood, and we're going to clean that up. And we're going to clean that up not only so we could have, so that I can avoid an infection locally, but also we talk about cleaning wounds to avoid uh, what people call blood poisoning for organisms to move into the blood supply. So if we leave the scuff knee aside and return to the mouth, well, uh, it's been said that there are more microorganisms that reside in a healthy mouth uh, as well as an unhealthy mouth than there are people on the planet Earth. So that's a lot of bugs moving around in the mouth. And we might aspirate them into our lungs or indeed if when we brush or we floss or we have uh, some type of intervention, a cavity or a filling that causes bleeding in the mouth, we're opening up a pathway for these organisms to enter the blood supply. And then where will they go? They will go to sites where they can thrive. And where do we thrive when there's competition? Well, where the body's weak. And so sometimes we have found, and the literature is full of um, uh, cases where organisms from the mouth have been found at sites where organs have been replaced. Uh, where joints have been replaced. And so these types of examples, I think, are really useful as we come together and begin to see that the mouth is not discrete, not a discrete entity from the body, but intimately linked. And so the health of the mouth can influence the health of the body and vice versa. Some of us, for example, might hold tension in our mouths. We grit our teeth, we grind our jaws, maybe our mouths become dry, that affects the pH of the mouth and that can have effects on digestion as well. So in many ways, uh, overall wellness is influenced by oral health and hygiene. Yes, definitely, that's a great answer. 
And um, with herbalism, many herbalists with, uh, work with populations where they have no dentists or dental tools available. What are your top three natural oral health items to include in a kit to use at clinics? Blimey, holy basole, that's a difficult question. Um, well, I think it's important to include uh, interventions, herbal interventions, because often they are accessible and often they're affordable. So throughout the world, I think if I could be sort of vague and then kind of fill in the gap, I would say first, uh, roots and twigs. And then I would go on to say salt. And then my third choice is most likely sage. And I reserve the right to change my mind uh, at any point in the future. So as alternatives to the plastic toothbrushes that we all know and most probably receive each time we see a hygienist and give us a, they give us a fresh toothbrush, um, we can use roots like licorice root or horseradish or marshmallow or uh, we can use these roots when they're dry and in the case of licorice, for example, uh, it's an excellent antimicrobial. It has a lovely flavor. Um, and we use a root, which is probably about maybe five inches long, like the length of a pencil, and about a quarter inch wide, maybe a half inch. Um, and we use one end of it, just like we use an end of a pencil. And we use it in a circular motion uh, and work to gently clean the gums and the teeth, moving the root in a circular motion, first going around the upper teeth and then the biting surface and then the inside of our teeth, and then coming around and doing the maxillary or lower jaw as well. Um, this is a great way to care for the mouth. It's also very portable and extremely affordable. And then as the root is used, the ends of the root become splayed. And over time, we might want to trim them with a pair of scissors. Uh, if we don't have roots like licorice or horseradish or marshmallow to hand, there are others. We can also use twigs like from birch or cottonwood or even neem. And again, using them in a similar fashion. Again, each of these herbs have significant antimicrobial properties as well as moistening properties and can be wonderful adjuncts for cleaning the mouth. Uh, with neem, there's a caution, of course, uh, when it comes to uh, pregnancy and anyone who is working to conceive should perhaps avoid the use of neem, uh, perhaps also externally. Um, salt, so I like salt and Ellingwood, an older herbalist here in American history, likes salt and uh, it's not often written about or discussed. But for many people, um, it can be used as an antiseptic wash by taking sufficient amount of salt in warm water and stirring it in until not only the salt dissolves, but we stir more in until there's a little bit left on the bottom, in the bottom of the glass. We call that a precipitate. And uh, that can be used to rinse the mouth. It can be used dry uh, to abrade the teeth, although that is often less pleasant and tastes kind of manky. Um, but it is an, an excellent antiseptic. And many people have salt and pepper on their, on their tables. Uh, iodized often but that's not the case around the world. So sea salts are available and very affordable um, and can be used to maintain the uh, appropriate microbial health of the mouth. And then sage, uh, salvia officinalis, 
um, I think it was Culpepper who said, if, every, if and everyone has sage in the garden, everything will be okay. And again, uh, easily cultivated, uh, widely abundant throughout a, a variety of climates. It's an excellent antimicrobial. It can be used uh, as an infusion or reduced for a stronger infusion. So setting aside accident and injury, which is a whole other discussion entirely, I would say that roots and twigs, salt and sage would be my three choices. And those are so accessible pretty much anywhere that you are on the planet. Those are great. Thanks. So with, um, as a practicing herbalist, do you include oral health questions on your intake? And if so, what questions do you usually ask your clients? Ah, now you're opening up a can of worms and I enjoy this immensely. Um, so yes, I ask my clients about their oral health. And at first, I felt a little bit uncomfortable about doing that. Um, but as a herbalist, I, I appreciate that many people are familiar with asking their clients about their tongues. Uh, and my experience is very few herbalists look beyond the tongue. So there's a lot to be seen. And some of what we can glean can be gleaned through a visual assessment of our clients. And that's something that people are trained in and, and are schooled in. Uh, a few examples here might be when we're talking to somebody, are there, is their mouth open or closed when they're at rest? Are their lips dry? Are they cracked? Um, do they have any sores on their mouths? Um, uh, do we see any debris? Does the breath smell? So much of that is even able to be uh, considered without a question at all. And then we can ask any number of questions. So I could say, so Denise, are those your own teeth? Um, or I can ask, how many teeth do you have? Uh, Many children and many adults don't know. They don't know which teeth have been filled or capped or crowned or removed. So all of that is important. And I never used to ask when I would go to see a dentist, but now I realize that, yeah, I'm in charge of the health of my mouth. And I want to know what's going on, when it's going on, and where it's going on. Um, so all of that is very important. Um, we can ask about whether or not people experience dryness or if they have a funny taste. Um, we can ask about daily care, like for example, how often do they brush their teeth? If they brush their teeth, uh, I had a friend whose husband only used to brush his teeth before sex. Otherwise, he would just rinse his mouth with tequila. Um, so I always <laughs> thought that kind of amusing. Um, but how do we brush? Once a day? Twice a day? Um, do we brush really quickly or do we follow the American Dental Association's recommendation of we should brush three times a day for two minutes each time. Uh, do we floss? Um, are there any issues or concerns? You know, we could sit and talk for probably 45 minutes about the types of questions we could ask about the mouth, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of a flavor. Definitely. Um, and that kind of leads to the next question, which is, as an herbalist, how do you approach the oral hygiene versus oral conditions um, and disease with different age groups and different clients? Well, that's a big question. Um, so I'm a herbalist. I'm not a, a dental professional. And when I see something that is of concern or a client expresses concern, uh, I have the um, wonderful privilege 
of having a competent and supportive and kindly friend, kind and friendly uh, dental practice here in Erie, Hammerley Dental Care, and I refer to them. Uh, so it's always good, I think, as herbalists to have a network of people that we work with. So in terms of diagnosis and disease, I refer out. Um, in terms of oral hygiene, you're absolutely right. And not only does it vary by age group, but it varies by health status. And it's easy to imagine that a small child who has a tiny hand and a small mouth would have difficulty with, say, an adult-sized toothbrush. And similarly, we might find that a person with arthritis in the hand might also have different difficulty with the same toothbrush. So paying attention to where our clients or family or friends are in their developmental stages is really important in helping people choose oral care regimes that match their health status. And I think that that is of paramount importance when we think about the oral health of people in a household. Uh, it's my experience that most families, families of two or more, will have one tube of toothpaste and two brushes, and if they use mouthwash, one mouthwash. And that sort of assumes that both people's health is the same, and the paste should be the same, and the rinse should be the same. And one of the great advantages of moving more towards herbal care for the mouth is that we are able to um, individualize care for people in a household in a very affordable manner. Um, so, how do I approach care? I approach it on a person by person basis. And I, with herbs, am able to cater to individual likes and flavors. We can make powders and pastes. We can make them in large volumes or short volumes. I mean, small volumes, sorry. Um, and we can change them up which is really nice. So, you know, sometimes when I purchase or explore a new tube of toothpaste, by the end, I'm like, done, I'm bored. And, you know, I've been brushing my mouth with fennel and for like 60 days already, give me a break. Um, so making oral care products is enjoyable. It's something that children can do and uh, something that adults can do also uh, for very little cost and a great deal of benefit. So does that answer your question? It does, yes, thank you. So I have one final question then. Um, okay. Do you have any final tips on how you integrate oral health into herbal practice? Um, well, you say plural, final tips. So that, um, is asking me to come up with more than one answer, and I really have only one, and that is simply ask. Um, work with the people that you're working with, ask them about their oral health, and it's often useful, so maybe I have more than one thing to say. Um, it's often useful to also demonstrate techniques, so whether we're working in the mouth or we're working somewhere else in the body, when we ask someone to make a cup of tea or suggest that they make a cup of tea, most likely they are used to a product like Lipton's that comes in a bag and they're, they're unfamiliar with how to use loose herbs um, and how to blend herbs. And similarly, when we talk about flossing, 
I've noticed that some of my clients will show me how they floss with a piece of floss that's about six or eight inches long. For me, I probably wrap about two feet of floss around my finger. I like to have a really long piece. It gives me a lot of freedom to work in my mouth. So just exploring techniques with people is what is really helpful. And over the year, the four years since um, Dental Herbalism, Natural Therapies for the Mouth has been published, I've begun to see that many people have a lot of fears about the health of the mouth. Uh, they avoid seeing dental professionals um, either for these very same fears or because of the cost of an intervention. And so being clear and upfront and calm and relaxed about the care for the mouth and offering tools to the people we work with uh, that's one sure way to integrate oral health into an herbal practice. Well, thank you. That's wonderful. You know, it's something I know we don't think about a lot, um, but it's so important, especially when, you know, that type of care is often no longer accessible to people as um, insurance has changed and our you know, and, and affordability has changed. So um, it's so wonderful to hear all of that information and the book <laughs> I know yeah. it's something I know yeah the that book has is, so much more <laughs> the book is great and uh you know we worked hard to keep the cost at under twenty dollars uh, so it could be a resource and when we start to add up the costs of over-the-counter tooth, pow tooth powders and pastes and mouthwashes and plastic toothbrushes uh, we see that for a family of two or five or four, we're really investing a lot of money in oral care tools. And if we turn to herbs, herbs, we can find a significant savings. Oh, definitely. Um, that's wonderful. So thank you so much for taking uh, the time to speak with us today. It's really important important information and I think it, it benefits us as herbalists. Um, and thank really you Janice. It. I am very much in awe of the work that Herbalists Without Borders has done and continues to do and yeah oral care I'm glad it is on the agenda and I'm pleased about that. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, thank you. And so everyone listening, to find out more about Leslie and Restoration Herbs and to find out how you can pick up a copy of her book, Dental Herbalism, visit her website at restorationherbs.com or visit the Herbalist Without Borders blog on our website where we post the latest podcast issue and um, information about Leslie and her business. So thank you again. Bye-bye. Thanks, Denise. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Herbalists Without Borders. We're a network of herbalists, traditional healers, complementary and alternative medicine clinicians, botanical medicine makers, herb growers, students, and just folks interested in the role of plants and wellness, sustainable agriculture, preservation, and restoration. If you value this content, please go to herbalistswithoutborders.weebly.com to make a donation or join as a member today. Support down to the ground green medicine in your community.